Hello and welcome to the International Daily Roundup by People's Dispatch, where we bring you some of the major news developments from across the globe. Our headlines. US continues its aggression over medical supplies, threatens India over export limits on anti-malarial drug. Japan announces state of emergency and close to a trillion dollars in stimulus package. Polish opposition criticizes government's decision to hold presidential elections despite the coronavirus outbreak. And Lithuanian socialist leader Aljidas Paleki is released after nearly six months in prison. We begin with an update about the COVID-19 pandemic. The total number of cases has come to over 1.36 million cases worldwide. The United States continues to have a lion's share of new cases with over 30,000 to the 73,000 new cases coming from the country. The US has further boosted its testing with close to 2 million people tested in absolute numbers in the country. But the rate of testing is still far behind most developed countries, standing at only around 0.6% of the population. The number of deaths around the world has crossed 75,000 and in the US it has crossed 10,000. Despite its vulnerable status as the epicenter of the pandemic, the US continues its strong arming tactics with other nations over essential medical supplies, while it has blocked all export of medical supplies produced by its companies, including N95 masks. Yesterday, we talked about how countries like Barbados, France, Germany and Canada, among others, have complained of the US blocking or intercepting their shipments of medical supplies and protective gear. Today, India has become the latest victim. Two weeks ago, the Indian government had halted all commercial export of several drugs that were deemed essential in the treatment of COVID-19 infections, including the anti-malarial hydroxychloroquine. The policy was to prioritize domestic needs within India and global humanitarian considerations. Yesterday, however, while speaking to the press, US President Donald Trump casually threatened India with retaliation if it decided to stop exports of the drug to the US. The Indian government gave a pacifying response, assuring that the restrictions did not apply to the US or any country affected by the coronavirus outbreak and are dependent on India's production capabilities for essential drugs. In today's In Focus, we speak to NewsClick's Prabir Purkaisa about Trump's threat and India's response. Thank you, Prabir, for joining us. So, uh, as we've seen, Donald Trump has issued a warning, there's no other word for it, and a threat to the Indian government and specifically to Prime Minister Modi regarding the drug hydroxychloroquine. And uh, we, there's a lot of confusion going about because on the one hand, there is the argument that uh, India should be supplying drugs, which is what it already has. On the other hand, there is the argument that we should be keeping uh, these drugs for ourselves at what, at, uh, at what could be a critical point. So before we get into that, we see that this is in some senses a very unfriendly move and also completely inappropriate at this point of time. You know, the United States has dealt in this particular way, right across the board, across countries, and it didn't matter whether they were allies, they were friends, or they were enemies, against countries which consider enemies, even on the conditions of a pandemic, it is not only worsening the sanction regime on them, but making no exception for health or any other issue. So that remains. But when it comes to health equipment in needs of medicines it needs, it has been, as you know, acting almost as a uh, highway robber, piracy, whatever you want to call it, snatching equipment away even from the tarmac of different countries and trying to explain it to the United States. We all accept that countries at the moment are desperately short of what is called personal protective equipment and ventilators. So the response has to be to a global leadership and countries coming together. This is something that G20 met as you go through a video conference. None of these things are discussed. These are not being discussed at the United Nations level or at the level of WHO where every country is represented. Instead of that, you are at the moment really looking at better thy neighbor policy on one hand. And if you have anything, that you manufacture, you hold on to. Now, this is the problem that we see. And the United States is very, very clear that it will continue to act only in its self-interest. It does not really care for a global pandemic or a global response. And this is the failure of global leadership the United States is clearly showing. Right. Coming back to India, I think there is a much bigger issue involved, not only hydro, hydroxychloroquine or anthropoquine, 
But how does India at this moment respond to a global crisis of uh, this kind? And I'm again, I would say that India is also need to be conscious about the, uh, what it owes to the people of the country and the measures it is taking, stopping export of essential drugs of different kinds, as well as hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. But on the other, the other side also, it is the global pharmacy of particularly uh, the poorer countries. And they desperately need, for instance, AIDS drugs and a whole bunch of cancer drugs that India now produces. And without that, there are people at risk. So how do we address the global need with the national need it's something we have to work out. And I would say the issue is not on the export ban alone. The issue is really how to ramp up production. Right. And to have the pharmaceutical companies in the country at the moment, can we really repurpose a lot of this production to produce hydroxy hydroxychloroquine? Because this is a very old drug. And it is something that we can do much more easily. And if you require to import bulk drugs, as we used to say, that the pharmaceutical uh, uh, ingredient, which is what the Chinese uh, today manufacture really large numbers. So that is something we should also be able to work out with China. So India and China can work together on how to become the global pharmacy. Chinese produce a huge amount of APIs. India really produces a huge amount of formulations and medicines. So both of us can act together in the global interest instead of making it transactional or basically bilateral, as Mr. Trump is trying to do. Right. I think that is the test we have. And of course, that also extends to personal protective equipment. We should be able to ramp up for ourselves. These are the initiatives, unfortunately, we may criticize Trump to act in uh, their national interest. But this is something we need to do in our national interest. How do you today ramp up either the person protecting the equipment. You have the war card case in Bombay, where the entire doctors, nurses, health staff, everybody in the hospital is now under the quarantine and has, has been found to be infected with COVID-19. Now, this is a very serious issue, because if the hospital is all sick, right. or becomes secondary centers of infection, there will be trouble. And I think that's where we are not seeing the government of India really batch it up. It's at both in terms of production of medicines and in terms of person protecting equipment. Right. And to a more slightly more technical question, how effective is this drug at this point of time? Because again, there's a lot of speculation about it, whether uh, there has been any actual proof. Is it being even used in India? Well, I think it is now being used as a part of the protocol. In fact, the, as you know, the anti aids drugs are much more expensive. We had a lot of uh, discussion with uh, Dr. Rath, Professor Rath, on this particular issue. And what you were saying is, if you're looking at anti antiretroviral antiviral medicine, then you have to give it very early. And if you give it very early, then you might be able to control the disease, but that really requires your being able to do it at this stage, which is the, almost the first preliminary stage of the disease itself. When the secondary stage takes place so when it attacks your lung, then you get a lot of inflammation. And inflammation of the lung is the key element which then causes the problem. And for the patients, people have the patients, we also get a secondary infection, which is a bacterial infection. So you need a combination of anti-inflammatory and antibiotics at the uh, point, which as it reminds you, as you know, is one of the uh, drugs which are also tested in the French example, this is not the right equipment, but both hydroxychloroquine as well as chloroquine phosphate were used in China as well, and they have an anti inflammatory property, which is why they're used in, uh, in rheumatoid arthritis, right. because it's an inflammatory disease. So there is a basis of why such a drug can be used to control the inflammation of the lung, and people are hoping. The green purpose of the drug today will be much faster than trying to find a new drug to be stable way for COVID-19 uh, on the SARS, uh, SARS-CoV-2. Thank you so much for being talking to us. Japan and Singapore have joined the countries that have taken to mass shutdowns to deal with the rising number of COVID cases. Japan declared a state of emergency in Tokyo, Osaka and six other prefectures for all provinces for a month. 
The emergency declaration comes at a time when Japan has been reporting over 100 new cases of infection daily for nearly a week. Japan has over 4,800 cases. The rise in infections has been alarming, especially for the national capital, which is over 1,100 cases. The densely populated Tokyo metropolis houses close to 30% of the population, hence a containment was deemed absolutely necessary. This declaration of emergency is the first of its kind in the country since the Second World War. But because of the constitutional limits on the powers of the government, even in the case of an emergency, the lockdown measures will not be on the same scale as the rest of the world. The declaration is followed by a massive stimulus fund that will cost up to 108 trillion yen or 990 billion US dollars or 20% of the national GDP. The stimulus package will include direct cash transfers to household, aid to small enterprises and deferments of tax and other payments. The drastic measures also come at a time when the government's approval ratings have been falling very sharply over the past month over what is seen as inaction in containing the spread. A fall of over 5% came in as alarming to the government of Shinzo Abe, which will be dealing with the general election in a year. The Polish government's move to conduct presidential elections has come under severe criticism from opposition groups. The election is scheduled for May 10th. It has been sanctioned despite the COVID-19 pandemic. The ruling, law, the ruling right-wing Law and Justice Party of the PIS is looking to capitalize on the relatively high ratings of the candidate incumbent president Andrzej Duda. Major opposition groups and progressive sections have already asked the government to postpone the elections until the COVID-19 crisis is under control. A proposal by the government to conduct a postal vote fell through for the second time on Monday. Many have accused the government of being late in announcing crucial measures to contain the outbreak. The opposition had pointed out that even recently announced containment measures will be effective only when a state of emergency is declared in the country. This is something the government wants to avoid as it will lead to the postponement of presidential elections and hence be a lost opportunity for the PIS. And finally, Lithuanian socialist leader and former diplomat, diplomat Algi Das Palegis was released from a jail following a court order on Monday. The order allowed for a conditional release with directions for more lenient detention. Following the verdict, Palakis was released from the remand centre but will be confined at home for more than six months. He has been incarcerated since October 2018 by the Lithuanian authorities on charges of intending to kidnap prosecutors and of being a Russian spy, both of which have not been proved. Palakis has been hounded for years for challenging the, for challenging the official historical narrative about the 1991 January killings. His writings have exposed the role of right-wing mercenaries in the death of 14 Lithuanians during the anti-Soviet protests of 91. Since his detention, Palakis has reportedly not been allowed to meet anyone except his wife on one occasion. The founder of the Socialist Party Frontas, which later merged with the Socialist People's Front, he has been witch-hunted by the Lithuanian government and right-wing elements in the country. Before the verdict, Socialist groups had conducted an online signature campaign to ensure basic legal rights of Palakis and to denounce the state-sponsored witch-hunt of Socialists in the country. That's all we have in this episode of the International Daily Roundup. To know more about these stories, visit our website peoplesdispatch.org and follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Thanks for watching. Yeah, can't